Hi, I'm Paul Bowman, CEO of Wexa, the digital fitness specialist who deliver over 25 million fitness experiences per year through their partners. Welcome to the Wexa podcast, where I'll be speaking to industry experts to bring you insights and advice to support your business journeys. In today's episode, I'm, I'm excited about this one, I'll be chatting with Peter Moore from Integrity Square, a results-driven financial and strategic advisory firm, as well as a host of a leading B2B podcast called Halo Talks. Peter, how are you? Great, man. Thanks for pumping me up, and I look forward to becoming an expert during and after the show. <laughs> Appreciate that. You are. You've got too much experience not to be, unfortunately. I think the title has to follow through. So, you know, it's funny. I, I tell people, like, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. So I got plenty of experience, and I'm just trying to pass along stories. The, the, the bleeding edge. Yeah, that's what – so where I always start, and, and I think – I don't think a lot of people know this about you. So, so maybe did I'm going to always do the did fitness find you or did you find fitness? Uh, Let's start I, totally, right I totally got super lucky. Um, you know, several people probably know my background, but yeah, you know, I was always an athlete back as a, a high school and, and in elementary school. Um, I was also the goalie. I played defense on every team, and I was not the guy who was you know scoring goals. I was the guy who was making sure we don't lose. Um, yes. And that mentality is very important. I think created a foundation for what I do now. And also my father was a CEO of a beverage equipment company, uh, coffee machines, cap cappuccino machines, a manufacturer. And he knew every person that worked in that 300 um, company operation from the person in the spare parts room up to, you know, the, the, the head of sales. Um, so I learned early on that, um, you know, I'd love to do something in the sports industry because that's what I get excited about on team sports. Um, but I had to go into banking and finance because that's basically, you know, what I was trained to do. So I went to Emory undergrad. Uh, I was the intramural athlete of the year and, and played in a fraternity. Um, from there, I went to Chase Manhattan Bank, was a investment banker uh, and worked in a firm called DLJ that then got morphed into Credit Suisse. Um, but I was on the mergers and acquisition side and I was always a deal hunter. So I was the yeah. guy to go out and find deals and open up doors. And uh, like you, uh, I'm not uh, an introvert. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll go out there and I'll, I'll hunt. Um, then I went to Harvard Business School. It got really cold up there in, this, in the winter of 99. So I looked for every private equity job down in Florida. At the time, there were only three private equity funds. Um, I got an offer from a fund down about 10 minutes from South Beach and decided lifestyle wise, probably too close to the amusement park um, down in Miami. I took a job down in Boca Raton, uh, hung out with my grandparents, which was awesome. Um, there wasn't a robust financial community down there, but I wanted to, to, to head south. Uh, so the first meeting that I went to at Broccoli Moran in Meisner Park, uh, they were going through the deals that they had under letter of intent. Mm. Uh, so they had an aerospace parts company. They had a company that did the blue chemicals and the toilets of the airplanes. I'm hoping I'm not on either of those deals. Uh, then they had, a, they had another aerospace company. And I like to fly, but I'm not like a mechanical engineer or parts guy. Uh, and then at the end of the meeting, like we've got a letter of intent to acquire Gold's Gym International. And okay. Paul, I literally scanned the room. Like I'm definitely the only guy who actually owns a Gold's Gym tank top, which I did. <laughs> I had a health club membership and I played sports basically throughout my life. So I raised my hand. I'm like, hey, can I be on the Gold's Gym deal? Uh, back in August 1st of 99, I basically haven't left the industry since. Okay. Uh, okay. So it started out as... Uh, a group that I was going to those buying companies in different industries as a generalist private equity fund. Yes. And I basically just hopped on the Gold's Gym wagon and I really couldn't take myself off because I was so passionate about the brand and about fitness and the fact that you didn't have to wear a suit and a tie um, yes. you know, to get dressed up to go One to the meeting. Benefits. And you can work yeah. out easy. You always get access to workouts. Yeah, and I used to carry my football around in my wide receiver gloves and literally like hang in the parking lot as I'm touring clubs. Um, yeah. So I did that uh, for a year, but I also got brainwashed at business school. If you have a good idea, you know, worst case scenario, you, you got a diploma from Harvard Business School, you'll be okay. So take risks. Yeah. Um, and if you hearken back to those days, we're probably close to the same age. I think I'm a little older. Um, everyone was on AOL you know, vertical net, there were all these, you know, Salesforce, crazy valuations. And I went down to private equity and I said, hey, guys, can we start up a Gold's Gym Internet group? And yeah. they're like, look, man, we don't know why you can't put an apostrophe S at goldsgym.com. I'm not that good with email attachments. So yeah. you're 27 years old, like run the Excel model, 
help us with acquisitions. We didn't hire you to be the, the, the strategy guy. We hired <laughs> yeah, you to do the work. Yeah. So I lasted there about nine months uh, and then started up a software company uh, similar to what you were doing, but uh, there was no broadband. Uh, there was yes. no Wi-Fi. Uh, there were you no were early. You were very stuff. early. <laughs> I tend to be very, very early uh, yeah. to the point where one of the guys I used to work for uh, at the time said, I think your uh, enthusiasm for the internet has yes. clouded your business judgment. <laughs> and that was back in 2001. Uh, obviously, you would not have It was hard not to, though, at that time, though, right? It was hard oh, not mean, to be enthusiastic about changing the world of the dot com before the dot com crash. Yeah. I mean, look, if you were uh, an old school private equity fund, you might think that yeah. the, the internet was just going to be like sending PDFs, you know, instead of sending <laughs> FedEx, right? So, anyway, so I started up a software company uh, called Fitness Insight. Uh, every two weeks, I used to sell some stock for my uh, personal portfolio to cover payroll. Uh, we had 30 people down in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, I lived in a uh, Ameris Suites. I rented a Pontiac Grand Am, and I was a crazy entrepreneur. Uh, and what we realized is that the industry was just interested in getting leads from the Internet. They really yes. weren't interested in online fitness nutrition. Um, so that company, after three years, uh, ended up leaving that company uh, because we basically were out of cash. Mm -hmm. uh, and I leveraged up my credit cards to pay for the servers. There's, there was no Amazon web services for, you know, yeah. a couple thousand bucks. It was like $11,000 a month in AT&T. Yeah. Uh, I had a, uh, a tech guy who had a drinking problem. So we had to make sure he could get and reset the servers, um, you know, when he was sober. Um, but what I did during that time is I totally understood the health club business model. And yeah. when I went back to banking in 2003, there was a, a lot of investors that were coming to the table saying, hey, interesting business, recurring yeah. revenue. You know, they're not, you know, churn and burn and, you know, the club doesn't open, but they collected all these paid in fulls. They were sophisticated yeah. uh, managers and, and club chains. So I kind of became the guy at this firm called Sage and Advisors, which was a reincarnation mm -hmm. of my DLJ uh, M&A firm that I worked at and became the head of a, a group that I started called the Active Lifestyle and Wellness Group. Uh, yeah. We did the Crunch Deal, Massage Envy. Uh, worked with several Gold's franchisees, mm -hmm. and we're trying to bring in as much growth capital uh, into the industry. So started out as a private equity guy, got mm -hmm. this opportunity to get on the Gold's gym wagon, kind of started bleeding, you know, black and gold, um, got all excited about that. The brand does it, 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 it has the appeal. Yeah. Um, and then went back to banking, you know, with, uh, with a couple of dollars in my pocket to buy a new suit and yes. um, started up a practice to basically say, hey, if you're buying anything in the health and wellness industry, I've lived in it. I'm a banker. I understand the unit economics, which guys you can and can't back, what mm -hmm. models work. Um, and, uh, and and did that for seven years. And then in 2010, started up my own firm, Integrity Square, uh, a little bit old school. I used to live in Union Square. So we used to always say, hey, bro, let's meet in the square. Um, okay, I'll I love ask where the name came from. That, that's where the name came from. So we would always say, I'll meet you in the square. Uh, yeah. And then there was a, a girl that I dated that got me a rock that was in, in uh, th with the word integrity on it. And I always yeah. felt like you have integrity or you don't. So yeah. what we say kind of in an old school way, if you're a client of integrity square, you're protected by the square. And mm -hmm. if you're a client of integrity square, um, you've earned it, uh, you yeah. know, and, and we trust each other. So what I'm trying to do and what I've been doing over the last 13 years is we've been probably done about a third of all the M&A and growth equity uh, placements that have been done, if, if you exclude Planet Fitness, um, we've done five Orange Theory deals where we're working with entrepreneurs that typically have more than $3 million of EBITDA, have a, a great concept that that they're continuing to grow and territory rights uh, and hooking them up with a private equity or a growth equity fund in the biggest transaction they're going to do uh, yeah. to take money off the table, stop signing personal guarantees on leases yeah. and on debt. Um, and professionalize the business. And, and so, what, what's the biggest challenges? So I'm going a little bit off script. Well, what are the biggest challenges there right now? Is 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 there is there disconnects or is is there alignment when it comes to these entrepreneurs taking money and valuations? And you know, talk to me about that space. Yeah. So you know, long story short, if, if a club chain or a studio chain or, or or a territory developer is not at or above pre-COVID levels, yeah. it's going to be very yeah. hard to convince an investor to pay a price that the entrepreneur or the seller group is willing to accept because yes. they still have visions that it's gonna get back there. The reality is that was two years ago. If your business yes. isn't back, like that's kind of on you. 
Um, yes. And there, there are deals that are happening now. We just closed a deal with a group called Bailey's out of Jacksonville, which is 16 clubs that were sold to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in that deal, there was a, a, a succession that needed to happen. Um, mm -hmm. the, the brothers were, were looking to potentially retire. They had yeah. their name on the door, so they had very sensitive um, psychology related to who they wanted to allow to run the company going forward or to rebrand it. Yeah. Um, and the buyer and several strategic buyers right now are looking at the cost of the real estate construction, mm -hmm. the permitting, going through the, the ramp up, the co competition. It might be better to go into a market and make an acquisition as yes. long as it's you know a reasonable price. So if I build a new health club on average, I should get my money back in a four year return. Yes, uh, yes. So I put down $2 million or, or after four years on a Planet yeah. Fitness, I've, I've exceeded okay. that. Um, in a health club uh, acquisition, you might say, hey, I'll pay five or six times cash flow to buy sure. that cluster. Uh, yeah. but, but I still have like my greenfield you know, <laughs> cost in my analysis that's kind of always in the back of my head. Like I'm buying somebody yeah. else's assets, but I'm also buying yes. their liabilities. In, in a sense. And, and what, like, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this podcast that, that are, you know, either, well, they've they've probably got enough capital that they're doing it great, or they're in that version of, hey, they're looking for growth capital. Like, what we, we talked offline that not everyone understands the complexity of actually how to sell a company. Like, what would be your, I don't know, three nuggets of advice to them? So, you know, the first advice is you got to understand your own business model. And you yeah. need to understand what the special sauce of that is. So if you look at, uh, I'll give you two quick examples and, and then the audience can kind of think about how they go to market. Um, if you look at Southwest Airlines, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have like your low cost, you know, budget uh, airlines around the world. Yeah. So if there's yeah. other one, you know, their business model, as an example, they only have 727 Boeing airplanes. Yeah. So their spare parts are for one aircraft, not 20. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there's no seat assignments. So we're getting people on and off the plane. There's no first class. There's no food. Um, so when you take out some of the things that create work or create an expectation on behalf of, of, a, of a member or a customer mm -hmm. in, in the Southwest Airlines case, it, you have to run a slower operation. So a Southwest Airlines plane hits the gate. It's out in 19 minutes. So they get two more turns or two more flights a day based on their business model. Um, if you look at a health club chain like Planet Fitness, as an example, if they did not have the annual maintenance fee of $29, which is now going to $39, the business model would not work. It would not be attracting capital because I got 10,000 members paying 30 bucks. I got 300,000. Mm -hmm. That's literally 50% of my EBITDA is coming yeah. from that one time hit. So that's a business decision. Orange Theory, they've got on average of 800 to 1,000 members. The only way a studio can, can have that kind of capacity ability to service is you can only let people come eight times or 10 times a month. Sure. So unlimited memberships are not unlimited memberships are limited. Um, mm -hmm. and that's like an important part of the business model. Um, so my first thing that I say to entrepreneurs is how do you run your playbook? And we wrote a book called time to win again, um, which basically said, if you're, you know, a football team or you're a soccer team, like you have a, a strategy, you have a playbook, yes. what's your offensive strategy? Um, and that strategy needs to be aligned in all facets. If you've got personal training um, and you've got group exercise, but you're at 19 bucks a month, when you mm -hmm. lose a personal trainer or you lose a, a group exercise instructor, you can't afford to go get a soul cycle instructor or a barriers. Yep. Camp. It doesn't fit with the business model. So don't think that you're going to you know, staff those people because that's not how the playbook is. Assembled, yeah, okay. Right. So I first say to, to people, look, figure out what your special sauce is, what the playbook is, and then you can articulate it and then show that yeah. to me in a unit economic model, because it all comes down to unit economics when somebody wants to you know, grow your business. Yeah. The second thing is don't come to me or anybody else and say, hey, I've got 10 clubs. Uh, the 11th club is the prototype. And that's the one I'm asking <laughs> you to fund, right? That yes, doesn't yeah. carry, carry any weight. Um, yeah. And then the third thing is you know, realize that your expectation on price uh, mm. you know, has to fit into an Excel model and you might be an awesome operator and you might be special, but somebody else needs to make a return on that and yeah. their job is on the line. Um, so typically the last dollar deals don't work out. You know, if you look at 24 hour, gone through bankruptcy sure. several times, yeah. um, some other failed transactions where a company got the last dollar and that yes. in the company was so much debt. And then the management team that thought they had a partner that was helping them grow 
took on too much debt that they dividended to themselves it and it didn't yeah. really set up the company for success. So the first thing is, what's the business model? How are you different? Understand yeah. either from us or from you or from other groups, like how, what are other playbooks that people are running? Like how to sell something. Yeah. So yeah. we do this Halo Academy. And we're trying to tell people, look, this is how your competitors operate. And here's how they make money. You got to okay. understand that in order to, you know, play against that. Because every yes. every you know football team, if you want to use that analogy, they got a scout. They're scouting yeah. who they're playing next week, and they try to figure out what's their playbook on offense yeah. and defense. So I think the same thing prevails uh, in business. So I'll stop there. Those are my three. No, but so so and I uh, know that was going to lead me into Halo Academy. So that is that's why you set up Halo Academy is to is to help them understand this process. Yeah. So so I went to to Harvard Business School. I got really lucky uh, that I was allowed to go there, able to go there. Yeah. Um, Congrats. And, Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate that. I don't have a refrigerator that has a magnet on it, or else I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not wearing the top, or you think you know? There's a lot of merch yeah. that goes with no, that. No, no, yeah, now I'm wearing the uh, cycle for survival in uh, LA like Galaxy that. soccer jersey. Um, but you know, when you take a look at how business school changes people's ideas and understanding of how businesses work, mm. you know, it's all case studies. So there's no academic book on like here's how marketing works or you kind of put yourself in and say, okay, I'm the uh, CMO of, um, of soul cycle and, yeah. you know, COVID hits, what do I do? Um, you know, so we, so what we did was we put together a five uh, night course over two weeks, whereas planet fitness case, and these cases are already written by business schools. Nice. Yeah. So basically I created the halo health, active lifestyle outdoors, I created a halo Academy. So we get five nights. Yeah. So it's two hours, we go through planet fitness, what where private equity comes from, which sure. uh, we should probably talk about for a second after this. Yeah. Yeah. Second is CrossFit and why there's no private equity in CrossFit because there's no exclusivity. It's just basically, uh, you know, f uh, fittest win. Um, yeah. Soul Cycle, which uh, somebody says, you know, should we have franchise Soul Cycle? I don't know. Can mm -hmm. you franchise the New York Yankees or yeah. you know Man, Man City? I don't know. It's all about talent. Um, yeah. Then we do Cycle for Survival on the nonprofit side, and then we do Peloton. We have people come in who are part of those brands after I go through a case study, which basically just asking questions from people. What do you think the special sauce is of a planet okay. fitness? You know, so, so we do that. So we've got, a, we've got about 200 executives that have yes. gone through the program, but the real reason why we did it um, is during when COVID hit, we're trying to figure out how do we stay relevant? How do we educate people on mm -hmm. the financial side of this business? And if we can educate more executives on how private equity, and financial yes. investors look at this business, if they just could figure out, here's a couple of things they're going to ask you, and I got to get yes. ahead of it, they're going to get capital. So what I want to do is I want to be at the nexus of how much capital could we get into the industry to back smart executives that have great business ideas that solve loneliness, diabetes, and obesity. And that's our, that's like the Halo Academy is trying to educate people. Mm -hmm. and say, now you can talk to talk. There's nobody that is going to, you know, stump you with like yes. what's your EBITDA margin in your internal rate of return? Be like, bro, I did that in Halo Academy, you know. That's, yeah, I'm not well, okay, yeah, and, and you know, from like it, it was a learning curve, like you know, selling selling Wix, it was a huge learning curve because, of course, you, you 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 teach, you understand the business inside out and every little nook and cranny, but sometimes the language that they use, you've got you've got to understand that. And of course, I didn't come; I came from the traditional roots of you know. Um, PT club, club management. I, I, you know, I in, increased my knowledge in terms of uh, MBA programs and stuff like that. But it still was a different, different world, right? So I think it's huge. And, and this is not just in, in the US. This is for for worldwide as well for the sure. executive world, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So we had some uh, executives out of uh, Australia from my zone. We had the guys at Fit Summit. Okay. Uh, we're yeah. part of it. Yeah. So we do it. Um, couple of times a year we've got another one coming up in september and we'll send out discount codes to you guys yes, to, uh, please. to yeah. distribute um but you know as we were going through halo academy and i think it's important for groups to understand that are listening private equity is not money that just kind of shows up from you know falls from the sky yeah. and most of the private equity that is backing companies in in any growth scenario is coming from universities the endowment funds, pension funds, uh, hedge funds, retirement funds. So when someone's like, oh, Crunch got money from, you know, TPG growth fund. Yeah. TPG's largest investor, I believe, is CalPERS. CalPERS mm -hmm. is the employee uh, retirement pension fund for the state of California. 
So the state yeah. of California basically owns like a large part of Crunch. At the yeah. same time, they also own the real estate through Realty Income and is an investor in the real estate of LA Fitness. Yeah. Um, so all this money that's private equity money is basically people like you and I or you know mm. executives that go and say, hey, I can go run some money. I can find some companies. I can buy them at a reasonable price. And I know how to help grow them. And I'm going to sell it to the next group. I'm going to keep 20% of the profits. And you're sure. going to get 80%. And I'm going to try and get you better returns than you know in the stock market. But when someone's like yeah. the big, bad private equity guys or, or females, like it's all money that's been given to them by like Harvard University and Columbia University and, you know, GM's, you know, pension fund. So yeah. it's not, it's not dirty money. It's not bad money. It's a weird no, it, Yeah. I get it. And then, and then like moving to, towards consolidation, like, like of course the hot topic at the moment in terms of uh, we have a lot of businesses are at and some, some, are, some are doing well. So t- taking the view of, you know, let's call it roll-ups, like what, what's, what's your view at the mo- on, on that at the moment? Yeah, do you still you still have me on? Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Okay. I got this go live button that just turned, came back on for some reason. We're good. Oh, head of the game. It's still good. It's still good. Right, still good on my side, at least. We'll clip this out. Um, yeah. So look, there's there's definitely consolidation that's going to happen, but you've got two levels of, of consolidation. One is a group that wants to go into a market. It says, as I said before, it's better for us to buy, establish ourselves, and then go build our prototype model around it, and then renovate yeah. whatever the clubs that we bought. So that that market right now, you know, to give out multiples is typically like a five times to seven times, five to six times club level EBITDA. And then you could argue about what the the buyer is actually going to retain on the on the regional overhead or the corporate overhead. And that's basically the fight. Um, if you've got a company like a solid core um, mm-hmm. that is looking to put in more Pilates locations as corporate owned. Uh, and they're looking to bring in a private equity fund. They grew very aggressively during COVID. And yeah. Solid Core's business model has got very low labor. So there, there's no showers. Uh, yeah. There's one person at the front desk. The person at the front desk then locks the door. They mm. teach the class. Everyone wipes down their, their Pilates uh, equipment and, and rolls out. So it's a great mm. business model. And, and Pilates has been able to hold the pricing of yeah. what, what people should pay, which is a very important part of the business. So there's, there's private equity firms that are that are backing consolidation plays, but they're being very mm. prudent about what they're paying. The debt yes. markets are very tight right now because of yeah. Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic yeah. and just, you know, in, interest rates getting higher to the point where if you're an entrepreneur and you want to do a deal, you got to mm. be very careful about what rates you're locking in for growth because some of these debt facilities are 10 to 14, 15 percent. And you might yeah. be really, you know, aggressive and say, hey, man, we're crushing it. But fourteen percent is a lot. Of, it's a lot of money that either catches up yeah. and improves <laughs> on top of itself, and you can realize yeah. at the end of the day that there's a big debt security and there's no equity yeah. left for you guys. So there's there's forces that are pushing towards consolidation, mostly because yeah. of territory grabs, um, yeah. and, and but it's it's thoughtful. Uh, and then I would say on the you know multi brand side, you really have only had exponential maybe any time yeah. to an extent. Um, to, to go multi-brand. So the jury's still out on if you could cross sell, uh, yeah. if that corporate overhead, uh, you know, is beneficial, but it all comes down to the unit economics. And that's yeah. what all these private equity guys want to see. How much does it cost to build it? How quickly does it ramp? Where are we at stable EBITDA? And then move on to the next one. So you got to yeah. focus on the unit economics. And, and uh, great advice. What, what and then how? What's your view? I guess from your point of view, and also private equity's point of view, in terms of the hybrid, is 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 it is it something that they believe in, or is it some as a general thought, or is it more not 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 a proven case yet in terms of you know essentially being relevant to members all the time? So making sure you're taking that attention span. So we we worked with one of your um, smaller competitors during COVID to, yep. to raise capital. Uh, okay. And the, the issue that and we raised a small amount of capital for him, but a couple of takeaways from that process yeah. was the usage inside the clubs was so low that yeah. it wasn't mission critical uh, yeah. and it could be pulled out without pissing off too many members. So one of the group, and this goes back to 20 years ago when I was running my software yeah. company, yeah. And I found out that if you don't go into the clubs, put your own signage up, educate the people, maybe even have one of your own people in there. The you, know, yeah. you, you got you got to spend the money in that because you have yeah. people on the ground. So I think hybridization mm. should work. 
but it has to come with a playbook that yeah. is important to everyone. And also they need to be compensated on it. It needs to be part of the PL. Yeah. And it, it's got to be part of the 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 workout and like the DNA of, of the club. Yeah, so yeah. Paul, I don't want you in here seven days a week. Okay. I love you. You're great hanging, dude. But you know, you take up space and your body's not set up for like you're not you're not a, a professional athlete, right? <laughs> no, so no, you don't need to do that. Yeah. So why don't you come in here three days a week? Why don't you take yeah. this one group exercise class? Why don't you do these two stretching classes, you know, online oh, after the workouts? Yeah. And why don't you do on Friday? Why don't you do this group walk that we have? Or why don't you go do this yeah. boot camp that we're doing? Uh, so I feel like it has to be part of the prescription. And the only way it becomes part of the prescription is if you get buy-in from the general manager, this head of sales, everyone understands, hey, this hybridization actually gives us the ability to communicate and have a relationship with people. Yeah. And yeah. it also creates intelligence of yes. how people are acting. So I said this kind of as a joke at this LA Fitness Connected Fitness Conference about four months ago. So it was like, what's the future of fitness? I'm like, first of all, there's all these AI companies here. Okay, mm. let me just let's just get this straight. I kind of lean in and I go like this. You can't <laughs> I go I go like this. You can't have artificial intelligence until you have intelligence. So, <laughs> so go back and fill out in the member management systems and yes. all these information, like what makes these people tick. And some of the examples I gave was when I was 12 years old, I was, I told you I played soccer. I was the goalie. Okay. The reason why I was the goalie is because I was chubby and my dad <laughs> let me go into his change machine and I used to buy shit from the ice cream man and put it under my bed and eat it late at night with fun dip, you know, candy cigarettes, Twizzlers and, and big league chew gum. Which had, right. I don't even think they told you how much sugar I, was on it. Cause it was like 80%. Yes. Yeah. So, I used to have to shop with my mom at a place at Sears called the Husky Department, which they have now banned the use of that term because it probably fucked up a lot of kids. So okay. I, so if somebody wants to motivate me, they got to know that Pete Moore never wants to go back to the Husky Department to buy elastic jeans, right? right. That's a trigger point for me. They also need to know that I played uh, high school basketball and I, uh, my ninth grade coach who yelled at me all the time, I went up to him, I said, Coach K, why are you yelling at me all the time? He's like, you should come up to me when I don't yell at you. Because I think you can be better and I'm going to make you better. So if there's a personal trainer or group exercise and there's like a hard ass instructor, somebody's got to know, Pete, you'll like this class. Like these guys going to yeah. yell at you like it's a boot camp. It's not like, yes. you know, like woke and like we're not keeping track of anything. Um, so, so my point is, if you don't know this information or you don't know that somebody's getting married in four months or you don't know that somebody just got divorced, yeah, or you don't know that yeah. there's an, an event planner that, that lived, that is one of your best members, like get all that information and then let's use it. And a hybrid, I feel like is a way to just kind of like own the member inside and outside the club, but yeah, do yeah, it, yeah. do it naturally, you know, yeah. well, and do it as part of the prescription. This is what we're saying to so many clubs is, is they're actually willing to do that. You know, we're, we're highlighting what is your goal and, and, and they can actually sometimes they can have an open field to write what they want to do. So if it is a wedding, if it is the outcome, because I guess what we all realize and our research keeps pointing back to is everyone wants outcomes. You know, the fitness industry keeps talking in membership terms, but they want outcomes. And I think there's that there's a disconnect. So if you can relate the the product to the outcome that they're wanting to achieve, you can hook them. And, and then, you know, what what we've realized and, you know, if you look at some of the success cases that, that we've seen in digital like the smart fits and rsg group and and basic fit is is they do that they do that phenomenally well and they do that kind of as osmosis that just that, that's just part of it if i don't understand right, the goal exactly. i don't know how to serve you the content um and, and but the content creation is the is the key point for us like you know and, and is, is what we're seeing where people are are taking you know some some clubs are getting 30 percent penetration on on their memberships using it weekly because of the fact that it's relevant content that they can have so they're not missing that instructor uh, on friday that everyone loves because they can have access to that person online right, right? but if you don't have that then so, you're going so, to struggle with so so the average operator and I've, I've kind of been one and i've also yeah. you know advised them you have to view hybridization and you have to view things that are that you're using technology, you have to use them as two things. You have to use them as a weapon, right? This is a weapon for, you know, my, my software system, that's like an, a, a, you know, uh, air defense system, right? When when Ukraine, you know, got invaded by, by Russia, what they asked for? They asked for javelins, okay? Yeah. That was the one weapon that they said I need. They didn't say I need, uh, I need some uh, powdered milk. Uh, can yes. you send me, you know, some M16? Did, did you send, send me javelins, dude. Yes. So if you're a health club operator or you're a studio operator, 
what is your javelin? Like your javelin is the relationship, right? So that relationship needs to go outside of the four walls here. And then it also needs to be in a position where people are saying, hey, I want to get you outcomes. Like I, I said to a Gold's Gym personal trainer, I'm like, you guys have X percent attrition, which is really high. And um, what's the probability that you can tell if somebody, if somebody says I want to lose 25 pounds in 90 days, what, what, mm -hmm. what percentage chance could, is that going to happen? It's like a hundred percent, dude. Yeah. Like it's yeah. science, right? Yeah. And, and it's yeah. motivation. So I feel like we got to stop, you know, saying, oh yeah, I got, I got this software. You're not using the software. You're not using the weapon, right? The yeah. weapon is the, is the digital, the way getting somebody's home. Hey, you're intimidated. I saw you didn't go into class. Why? I'm intimidated. Why don't we do this online? I'll come to yeah. your house. Yeah. I'll do it with yeah. you. Or I'll go, yeah. I'll pick you up to go to the club. You know, I don't know if you got yeah. picked up to go to high school or elementary yeah. school. So pick me up, dude. Or like go to Silver Sneakers and say, Hey, we're doing a class at two o'clock. Don't wait for people to show up. Go out with no. a van and pick them up. Correct. You know, there's Correct. like just take the friction away from the experience. Yeah, and and the digital is a very soft approach on saying, let me show you what goes on here, right? You don't. Yeah. People are still intimidated coming in. You know, sure. Seeing guys like you and me, dude. I mean, that's. No, I'm just kidding. I'm saying just like, you. you, know, it's, it's you. Dude, just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back up, right? Um, yeah. Wearing a tank top, bringing in like my milk jug. <laughs> But the point is, like, we've got to... I've got to see you in the gold gym vest, Peter. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what I'm looking forward to. Next, right, next right, time. Uh, yeah. I'll get, I'll get a, a, you know, I'll get a new, once I get a new man groomer, you know, I'll... Okay. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> do that um, but my point is, like, we just got to, like, dial it back to, like, how do we foster relationships? How do we help people, like yes. you say, get results? And the hybridization yes. is, like, a no-brainer because everyone's got their cell phone. And that's basically all they stare at all day. So if you're not relevant on that phone, you're not relevant anywhere. Totally, totally. And, and, and you know, like the, the thing is, I still don't completely think a lot of our industry understands the relevance of the the attention economy. Like exactly what you're saying. If you can if you can control the eyeballs, you can control what they do, their outcomes, how you can best in, in, enhance their ex fitness experience. And if you don't do that and you're only expecting them to come to your club to be able to do that, or that's the key part of it and everything else is just a little bit of afterthought, you, it, you're not actually serving the members as best as you could do. And also, the hybridization or digitalization of your club is not an expense. It's an no. investment in your revenue. It's an investment in your offering. Uh, marketing is not an expense. Marketing is a, is a is the gas that feeds your sales engine. Yeah. You know, yeah. Planet Fitness yeah. spends twelve thousand dollars a month on advertising per club, plus yes. national yeah. ad fund. You go to yeah. any other club chain, they're spending like a third to half of that, and they don't realize that like there's a there's a volume machine going on here that spends money on keeping that thing going like that agreed, if agreed. you don't do that then you can't run that business model yeah, like yeah. That, that well like if, if i took if i took like a subsect section of our most our top 10 clients they all see it as a marketing cac activity um more than they see it as a you know and some of them of course saw it as especially the, you know the peloton growth days is hey we could also play in the same space but it's it's you know yeah you can play in the same space you've you got to compete in the same way like what it's your point what is your secret source but the the secret source that the clubs have is the physical experience which is the best experience and it's how do you support that to to, to be the best combined experience is where our industry can really do great things. Look, you go into certain clubs and, and people are walking to the front desk and they're, and they're saying, hey, Paul, man, good to see you this morning. You know, what are you trying to achieve today? That's awesome. Right. Yeah. There are others that, that, that just have like they're down with their phone. Yeah, it does. Even checks in. Right. So yeah. if you, you you're paying rent in order to establish a personal and physical relationship with someone, yeah. don't yeah. think that you're like disadvantaged because you don't have um, you know, just a, a corporate office and servers, you know, you know, like Peloton, like people want, and also the, the hybridization allows you to micro target. Like if I do soul cycle class, like I do it with Sumner, I do it with Mantis, I do it with Jadis. They're not on the soul cycle, um, no. bike digital. App. Why not, dude? Yes, Why would yeah. you not rip 10 videos so I can work with them? So if you think about all the clubs that are out there and you talk about content creation, Basically, each one of these, you know, evangelists or group exercise instructors is, is, is responsible for 50 to 250 of your members. Yeah, give them yeah. a little bit of, you know, give them a little bit of showtime and yes, realize yes. that they can, if you're going to interact, yeah. I don't want you doing yeah. Instagram live. I don't want you doing Facebook. I want you doing yeah. it here and I'm going to compensate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think 
a big reason why we ended up starting Wexit was, you know, in, my, in the gym box days is that we realised that, you know, we would average, what, 3,000 members in those clubs, but 1,000 members were affiliated to three trainers. And then when we actually dissected those three trainers, those three trainers were only doing one session a week. So essentially we're pissing off you know, a lot of members every single time because they couldn't get access to that person. So it was like, you know, the, and, and I think I think that's the huge COVID shift from our point of view as well. I don't know if you've seen that, is that, you know, a lot of those trainers that probably didn't realise they had that power have now realised that power because they got forced to realise that power in terms of either creating their own platforms, being part of uh, the platform within a club, you know, and doing all those stuff. Because, you know, th this is the, I think the a lot of the missing links when you talk about usage as well is you know those influences or group exercise instructors or whatever you want to call them they have to be in the cut of improving this whole platform you know if they're the ones that are sharing it on their social media sometimes that's more powerful than you know the generic brand's social media so um just your yeah. point did you point on that so i don't lose my train of thought sorry these group exercise instructors and personal trainers they, this is the one way that they can actually scale their business Right? Yeah, like so how yeah. is it not full alignment in, you know, hey, let's get people online. I'm not taking them from you. I'm giving you the ability no. to, like, multiply the amount of, you know, yeah. uh, well, the, relationships and building, you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you saw that the, a lot of people were repeating back the Disney stats to me. So they took away, just take away Disney Plus altogether. But they, they kind of did an article based off how much people engage with content after they see the parks. Um, and it's a direct correlation to our industry. So they this literally, you know, say, say you watch Iron Man videos, you go see Iron Man, you, you get inspired by seeing Iron Man, then you watch him about 50% 50, 50 more. And it's exactly the same. If you're watching mm. that person and then you're going to see that person, you're going to engage with the content more. It's a great cycle to have for us to improve the life of those people. So look, we, uh, you know, I feel like we could do like a part two of this podcast, but I, I want to keep this short because, you know, yeah, you going. so I guess the probably the big thing for me, and it's the generic question, but I do actually want to hear it for yourself is is you know predictions of for the future like like how are you seeing the next kind of you know mid short mid and, and long term play out yeah look from, I a think, no, from, yeah, from a capital standpoint you know i think there's going to be further to you know segmentation and there's going to be winners in each category so you got planet yeah. fitness that is going to win you've got su yeah. super regional chains in the u.s that are going to become 100 to 200 yeah. Uh, club locations and what I think they're, they're going to do is they're going to listen and figure out from the studio concepts what's mm -hmm. actually drawing some of their members away like workout recovery okay sure. let's not let this happen what happened last time with planet yeah. by on the pricing side let's not let a workout recovery concept go next door to us and basically yeah. use us as their lead generator why don't we yeah. put this inside the club right so yeah. Yeah. I think the clubs are going to become much more attuned to what is everything what is what are the main members that we're trying to target what do they want mm -hmm. do they want uh you know a couple of pickleball courts do they want yeah. you know half court basketball do they want to have a uh, outdoor workouts do they want to have you know a crossfit you know inside of here so i think it's going to become more of like a an arena is what yeah. a, a health club will come and Words there'll all. either be yeah. ways ways to potentially like sublease areas or have sure. you know like profit centers inside and everyone's got to yeah. be working together um there's a lot that's going on on the technology side it's really hard to to calibrate you know all the the data that's being collected yeah. and you know i think my zone does a great job you know apple watch obviously mm -hmm. garmin um so there's going to be reimbursement uh for sure. that and the clubs need to have you know probably one of the things i would have from a club right now is i'd increase my broadband on my wi-fi so people can actually do things inside the club because that's yeah. a big deal that's um, a huge deal <laughs> Yeah. And, and I think it's going to be about, you know, setting up some type of reward system or frequent flyer system that yeah. allows people to feel like they're part of a community. They're being incented, you know, monetarily for, for the workouts. Um, yeah. There's challenges that are going to be associated with that. And then they're going to be able to look at their own data and potentially, you know, lower their, their health insurance costs or, you know, be, get benefits yeah. from their, from their employers. Um, but I do see, you know, I've been a big advocate of bricks and mortar since, you know, mm. the day COVID started. I was calling bullshit sure. on a lot that was going on um, because people want to get out of their house. People want to be part of a community. Uh, people yeah. want to sweat together. Um, yeah. and, and and all that's going to continue. But there's going to be big boxes that cater to families. There's going to be studios that cater to, to people like you and I that might want to be like yes. weekend warriors. Um, yeah. And my only concern is, you know, what's the special sauce of what? 
you're, you're a new yeah. entrepreneur. Like, don't come in here and oversaturate the market and say, oh, I can do spinning for 19 bucks. I'm like, why, dude? You're, you're going to make $2,000 a month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I hope that there's like a step up in people saying, hey, look, if, if an Orange Theory is effectively $20 per class, mm -hmm. then why do we have to service anybody for less than $20 a class? And unlimited yeah. memberships are not limited. Right? Yeah. have to be limited. Um, yeah. So, so I, I think the, the digital is going to allow us to get closer to the member, understand their motivations, um, yeah. and really start to care about it. Because if, yeah. if we're losing forty percent, did this at a, at a show? If you're at forty percent um, attrition or people that are yeah. exiting your facility, you're basically between a lap band surgery and like yeah. gastrointestinal like percentage of success. Right? There's no yeah. way we shouldn't be at like 85 percent if people totally care. Good. And call all your members. If you got 300 members, don't send an email out. Call them. Buy yeah, them a exactly. cup of coffee. You know, yeah. find out what they want. Um, so that's where I think, so I think the industry is going to continue to go bricks and mortar. Technology mm -hmm. is going to be inside of the club. And I hope at yeah. some point in the near future, all of the connected fitness equipment is basically on consignment. And then the club becomes the distributor and the retailer. That is the way that should, that whole ecosystem. Working on that. <laughs> All right, I'll sign an N. Uh, there's my invisible NDA. Yeah. And then how do people get in contact with you, Pete? Um, so we're, we've got um, uh, Pete at IntegritySQ.com. So IntegritySQ.com is our uh, advisory firm. We've got the Halo Talks, which is on all the yep. big uh, uh, channels and HaloTalks.com. Um, and in Halo Academy, we do, you know, anywhere between once a quarter to uh, – uh, special events where we'll go in, and uh, go in and meet with teams and, and, and yep. do it directly there. Uh, and, and so we, those are the three. We'll, we'll, we'll link those events as well on, on, on these posts and, and so everyone can find out and how to get access to the, that Halo Academy. I think that, that's it's, it's a wise move for a lot of people yep. listening. And the last thing I would say, um, and I say this kind of as a joke, but people need to know this. The earth is moving around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour. Okay. And it's rotating at 1,200 miles an hour behind a fireball, around a fireball that's at 95 million miles away. Take the time to slow down. Figure out what your business is going to be. We're going yeah. fast enough on the planet. Slow yourself down and yeah. do the work to understand, hey, this is a business that has a special sauce to it. This is yeah. worth me waking up and I can scale it. If not, don't keep doing the same thing because you're going to get the same result and nobody's going to buy the business at the end of the day because you think you built something. And my ex uh, uh, business partner that, that I used to work for said, if you build value in a mm -hmm. business, when you want to sell it, someone is, will pay you for the value that you've created. So Amazing. build the value. So, hey, man, it's great yeah, to touch your base yeah. with you. Peter, that is the best ending I think we've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> All right, man. No, no more pressure. Let's end it here, bro. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. All right, man. Cheers. Go Halo. Bye.